over the world, people are spending more of their lives online. It's where we get our news, communicate with friends, shop and increasingly access government services. For those used to being constantly connected, when the internet goes down, life can seem to stop. But what about the 4 billion or so people who aren't connected? There's a growing recognition that a wide range of human rights depends on access to the internet. Think about the right to freedom of expression, for example. Without access to the world's most popular communications medium, can you fully exercise it? The right to access, as we'll see, isn't just about being connected to the internet. As a concept, it provokes difficult questions about inequality, its status in law and security. This video will look at all of these in turn. By the end, you should understand the key issues and challenges in the access debate, how these are playing out on the ground, and how you can engage with them as a human rights defender. When we talk about the digitization of human life, it's important to acknowledge that this process hasn't occurred at the same speed in every country. In its early years, the so-called information revolution was very much a global north phenomenon. The richest countries were the first to enjoy widespread internet penetration, and most of the big tech players were built there. This became known as the digital divide, a term which was first introduced at the World Summit on the Information Society in 2005. It was recognised that access to information and sharing and creation of knowledge contribute significantly to strengthening economic, social and cultural development, thus helping all countries to reach internationally agreed development goals. From this, bridging the digital divide became a mantra for increasing broadband access and distributing devices, and the main basis for many national action plans and broadband strategies. But a decade on, it's become clear that there are in fact many digital divides. There's the big one between the global north and south, but there are also divides between rural and urban areas, between genders and between different racial groups. Even among those connected, there are enormous differences in access, in terms of cost, speed, language, whether it's a fixed or mobile connection, and increasingly, quality, which we'll look at in more detail later in the video. In other words, providing access is not as simple as building broadband infrastructure. So if that's what the right to access refers to, what's its status in law? There is in fact no internationally accepted right to access, but in human rights terms, access is a necessary condition for the realisation of human rights online. In some countries, court decisions have ruled to support a right to access, including in France, Costa Rica and Germany. And in a few rare cases, like Finland, states have enshrined the right to internet access in their national laws. But these isolated efforts aren't enough. And in the absence of an international agreement, private entities are stepping in with their own solutions. For example, some companies plan to provide internet infrastructure for free through balloons or drones, but often this is totally unregulated. Another well-known way private entities are getting involved is through zero rating. This refers to the practice of providing certain online services free of charge, which typically means either 1. Offering services on top of an existing data cap. For example, a plan which gives customers 300 megabytes a month for all their internet use but unlimited access to WhatsApp. Or 2. Offering unpaid access to selected services on the internet. Facebook's Free Basics is a prominent example of this. Given that the internet has become an indispensable tool for realising a range of human rights, combating inequality and accelerating development and human progress, ensuring universal access to the internet should be a priority for all states. This statement by Frank LaRue, the former UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, recognises that access, if delivered properly, can enhance everyone's enjoyment of human rights. But it also implies the opposite. If delivered the wrong way, access can restrict human rights. Security is a key dimension of this debate. With the rapid growth of users worldwide, the infrastructure of the internet is expanding, making it more difficult for states to ensure the security of networks. Some states are responding to this challenge with increased control through measures like censorship, surveillance and internet shutdowns. Such control interferes with the free and open nature of the internet. But access without security isn't real access either. You can't exercise your rights online if you're at risk of crime or fraud. Getting the right balance between security and human rights is therefore crucial. But states aren't the only relevant actors here. 
Private sector practices can also restrict people's ability to access the internet. At first glance, these practices might seem uncontroversial. What's wrong with giving people free infrastructure or access to services? The problem is that in these cases, access is conditional or limited. Unregulated infrastructure can be closed to new providers, creating the potential for monopolies. And limited mobile internet services can limit users to a walled garden, where the only content you can see has been approved by the provider. To go beyond it, you need to both be aware that a wider internet exists and be willing and able to pay for it. This has clear implications for freedom of expression, the right to information and other rights, like privacy, if the provider in question collects your data without adequate safeguards. Some argue that any service is better than nothing, but initiatives like these can normalise the idea of a two-tier internet, with quality of access dependent on your ability to pay for it. Strategies to increase access are being developed through several international forums, including the WSIS follow-up process, the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals and the International Telecommunications Union. Regional organisations play a big role in developing broadband infrastructure. Key players here include the African Union, Organisation of American States, Association of Southeast Asian Nations and other international donors. Many countries also now have national broadband strategies. Where they exist, they generally need close observation from human rights defenders to ensure they're being properly implemented. Where they don't exist, sharing best practices could offer a useful way forward. Tech companies are also a key constituency. With businesses like Google and Facebook leading initiatives to provide access in the global south, Human rights defenders need to be making sure that these activities adhere to international human rights standards. On the civil society side, there are multiple international and regional alliances advocating for rights-respecting access policies, like the Net Neutrality Coalition, EDRI and Fight for the Future. In 2015, the Indian launch of Facebook's zero-rating initiative Free Basics triggered a major campaign of resistance led by a coalition of over 30 representatives from Indian businesses and civil society. The campaign gained widespread traction in part for a series of videos starring Indian comedians which explained, in simple terms, the implications of zero-rating for net neutrality. These videos were watched millions of times and attracted international coverage for the issue. In response, Facebook launched a major public relations campaign, which included huge billboards and targeted messages to every Facebook user in India. In spite of this, in 2016, the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India banned all zero-rating networks, which was interpreted as a victory for the Save the Internet campaign. We've just seen how concerted activism at the national level can get rid of obstacles to the right to access. This next example shows us how regional advocacy can help support the adoption of better policies on access. The Alliance for Affordable Internet is a coalition of over 60 organisations from civil society, the private and public sector, aiming to make internet access in developing countries affordable through policy and regulatory reform. Launched in 2013, it currently operates in six countries – Nigeria, Ghana, Mozambique, Liberia, Myanmar, Dominican Republic. It develops joint initiatives across stakeholder groups to address local access needs, for example, fighting for subsidised internet access in public schools and libraries. It's clear that human rights defenders have an important role to play in this debate. Building public awareness is key. Issues like zero rating and net neutrality can be complex and technical, but sound arguments and a bit of creativity can overcome these barriers. Looking at the bigger picture is also important. Access isn't just about infrastructure. It intersects with a range of issues – political, economic, social and cultural – which all need to be addressed. In this debate, businesses are arguably as influential as governments. Building alliances across stakeholder groups will therefore be critical if we want to see the full realisation of a right to access. In the next module, we'll be looking at regulatory frameworks and policy making. Music